Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We're glad you're with us this morning, and we're excited. This is Black History Month, so we get to celebrate the history of black folks in America. Uh, sometimes there's not a lot to celebrate, but we need to find those things that we can celebrate. And 2024 Black History Month theme is African Americans and the Arts. And today we have Alan Frimpong with us this morning. Good morning, Alan. Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you running? I'm great, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Fantastic. Uh, what part of the world are you in today? I'm in Inglewood, California, um, a.k.a. land, you know, story by the Tongva people. But um, all is well. All is good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking our time to share with us. The organization you helped to uh, found is called Zeal. Uh, what is Zeal? What is Zeal? So Zeal is a worker-owned creative arts studio alliance. And as a cooperative, as a black arts cooperative, we create spaces for black artists to thrive. That's our vision. And in terms of the work that we do, we focus on creative talent development, cultural production through exhibitions and activations, and then uh, creative placemaking. And uh, our roots are in Brooklyn, New York, where we were founded and incorporated. Um, and now we have a studio practice in Inglewood, California. And we have affiliation also in Miami, Florida as well as in now Accra, Ghana, uh, more recently. Uh-oh. So you're mm -hmm. international. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the U.S., you've got Miami in the south, New York in the northeast, and Inglewood in Southern California. Fantastic. Uh, now you go to Accra right. in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So tell me a, a little bit about you before we get into more about Zeal and what Zeal is doing. Uh, where did you grow up? Yeah, so uh, I was born in Newark, New Jersey. So I'm a Jersey guy. Pretty much have been there the majority of my life. But the uh, other piece is that uh, my family is from Ghana. Okay. And so uh, while I've been there, um, I've also been back and forth between the States and Accra uh, for pretty much the majority of my life. I'd probably say the first time I went to Ghana was like around eight years old. And then, yeah, I've just been back and forth ever since. So I've always been in these two different cultural worlds, you know, uh, between growing up in Jersey and then visiting uh, Ghana. And uh, more recently, I've been spending much more time there for the past six years. So a crowd's on the southern end of Ghana. Is that a port? Is that water? Yeah. So, yeah, Ghana is in uh, West Africa, and Accra is, yeah, right right at the uh, southern tip, right at the Atlantic Ocean. So, um, and, and more recently, it's it's become much known for um, its year of return celebration that happened five years ago. And since then, they've been engaged in the Beyond the Return activities where uh, Black people across the diaspora can uh, return to, to Accra as, as home. And that's been part of the initiative around the country of Ghana um, for many years. So it's actually been a long time coming for this uh, initiative to launch. And I think it has a, a lot of significance for many people across the diaspora who can come back to Ghana and see Ghana as home. So I have, uh, I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, which is a very small town in 
in West Virginia, coal mining, blue collar, relatively poor folk. And a family from there that I grew up with moved to Ghana and built a home. Mm. And then there's a young lady that I've known her since she's about five. She may be 30 now. She just recently married last year, and she and her husband, well, they went together to Ghana as uh, as, as a fiancé, and they came back, got married, and they're back there in Ghana. So I got, I've got friends that have done that, and I've looked at uh, – at the map, that's where I knew where Accra was. Uh, mm-hmm. And I've had friends that have wanted to do business in Ghana. So I haven't been there yet, but I'm mm. going to get there. going to get there. Maybe we'll go together. But before that, let's talk about you grew up in Brooklyn. Your family's from Ghana. What about school? Where, where did you go to school? And did you get to college and all of that stuff? Yeah, so uh, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, went to school, went to high school at Piscataway High School, Piscataway, New Jersey. Uh, so there's that. Mm-hmm. And went to, uh, ended up graduating from there, then going to Syracuse University for undergrad. And so, you know, I was really active in like sports, so track and field. And even before that in high school, like I did a, a short stint with football. And I also just was involved in a lot of like extracurricular activities that had to do with service. So, you know, I was in Key Club, became the president of Key Club, went on to Syracuse and uh, was involved in a lot of organizing on campus and off campus, working on issues of environmental justice, looking at built environment in, in Syracuse and seeing how in particular black people were treated um, and some of the economic disparities that faced many families there, even though the the private university was there. And then I also was engaged in the uh, black newspaper and the um, the black artist league. Um, so yeah, what? it was really active on on campus. What did um, you major in? Uh, you see how I led with all that? <laughs> I did. And I have not told you about like what I majored in. So, you know, I started out at Syracuse in uh, the engineering and computer science department in the school of um, uh, engineering and computer science in the department of biomedical engineering. So I got my uh, degree. I actually ended up getting a dual degree in biomedical engineering and philosophy mm. in the College of Arts and Sciences. So, <laughs> and I barely made it out by the skin of my teeth in like four and a half years. Okay. You know, um, getting that degree. So <laughs> that's why I got my undergrad in, you know. Uh, and then I went on to CUNY Hunter in New York City and I got my master's degree in urban affairs and planning. Mm. Yeah, from CUNY Hunter. And I feel like that was a that was a a huge transformation to go from like, all right, I'm I'm doing the engineering thing, and you know I didn't really take many jobs in my actual uh, field of study <laughs> once I came out of undergrad. Like I I got a job at like Jensen Pharmaceuticals for a couple of months, and you know, I had a job at uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey for I think like the first like year and a half. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was like, I don't want to do this, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so I ended up getting a job working on issues of public health through the Arc of New Jersey and um, a couple of other different nonprofit organizations. And uh, I ended up joining the Malcolm X grassroots movement coming out of school, um, working on, you know, um, issues of homelessness and food security in Newark and addition to that, you know, I supported some of the political education, cop watch work and the Brooklyn chapter for the Malcolm X grassroots movement. So shout out to them. But uh, shortly thereafter, I decided to go back to school for urban planning just because I was like, ah, with all of these social issues that drive me, this is this is the actual work that I want to do. So, you know, there's a lot that I gained through my, you know, formative education, Mm -hmm. you know, because now I can say I can call myself a a social engineer. I think there's a lot in in engineering school that taught me about innovation, 
and being able to build things and finding a process in terms of project management to do that. And I just put that and connected that with my passion of social justice issues. I just like remember in engineering school, me bringing up these issues of like injustice and like my professors not really know what to do with me around that, you know? So um, <laughs> I just knew that it was like very formative for me to be like, huh, I don't think that um, I want to be <laughs> Nike testing the durability of sneakers. Like I thought that that's what I wanted to do because I was a big sneaker geek. But in the end, I was like, huh, I see this urban planning degree and shout out to Sigma Ship and uh, folks like John King, who were my advisors. But like those two men of color were really formative in being in really guiding me in my time at Hunter um, and really being a able to explore and being like, oh, I actually care about the built environment and design and how those things impact, you know, Black folks and by and large folks who are at the margins of society and questioning how this country was built and was it built in a way and designed in a way when we look at our cities uh, in ways that impact us and how those cities facilitate um, spaces of commons for work, play, leisure, and all of that stuff started to inform ultimately um, my vantage point in the kind of... Um, work that I'm engaged in now. But um, yeah, I just remember like from high school, I should also say like I'm an Anytown USA kid. So in high school, like I was doing like diversity camps and diversity trainings and peer, peer facilitation because uh, Anytown USA is part of the National Coalition of Jews and Christians. And also the organization is now um, the American Conference on Diversity. So yeah, in my <laughs> teens, I, I was already like, tapped in and got language very early around like what does social justice actually mean what does it that's, mean to be that's justice? fantastic that's really and, fantastic and have, so i'd be remiss if i didn't say that like <laughs> if it wasn't for like key club and like that organization i don't think i'd be here and i should also say you know part of my also lineage is that I was a uh, people for the american way young people for a fellow also while i was in the Malcolm X grassroots movement. So those, all those things informed my trajectory. I would even arguably say more so than my formal education. I think once I got my master's degree, I think that crystallized a lot for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those, those, those other organizations were pivotal in my own political growth and ultimately informed how I became interested in co-ops and then also like connecting that to like my own people lineage and like the experience in particular of like black people um in the united states and their role in the development of uh co-ops and solidarity economy work fantastic listen i was smiling as you were talking because i'm sitting in a class 1970 at Penn State working on a doctorate in mathematics, okay? Mm. And folks were picketing uh, about uh, the Vietnam War, and I'm wanting to talk to the professors about that, and there was no conversation about it. Uh, gays were coming out of the closet perhaps for the first time, and I didn't understand that, and I wanted to talk about that. And I talking to those professors, it was, again, no. So I ended up with a master's. Matter of fact, I, I taught the next year, uh, I taught at City University in York College in, out in, in Jamaica. I taught algebra and stat and pre-calc. So, uh, yeah, it, it's almost like you have to go through these classes, you have an idea of what you want to do, and you start on that road and you find out, yes, I do, or no, this doesn't work. Uh, but all of that extracurricular stuff is where you end up finding, so at least that's what I did also, finding out what it is, what it is I want to do. Okay, so you mentioned co-ops. Tell me again, how did you get involved? Where did you get introduced to co-ops? Uh, I would say, like, before I even knew the term co-ops, 
I grew up in a home that was just very much about, I feel like my mom and my dad always had this value of service and also this piece around like collective work. So I feel like those two, you know, values, I, I, I grew up with that, especially going back and forth between the States and Ghana. It was, it was cool to kind of see the cultural facets of what we would now say is you know, communalism, you know, mm -hmm. um, and how like my family, like when there was conflict and issues, it's like, no, we're going to have a family meeting <laughs> and we're going to come together and we're going to like sort this problem out. Like not one person is going to make this decision about this issue that happened. We actually need to have a whole family meeting about this, <laughs> you okay. know? Um, so okay. it was like, oh, okay, but I go to my friend's house and this is like, that's not how I see things going. So to see the cultural differences, there's that piece. But I would say fast forwarding to my time in the States, uh, I first got introduced to co-ops when uh, I think shortly after some of my nonprofit work and my time at uh, MXGM, I got a um, job running a youth led organization in my like mid later 20s in, in London. So it wasn't until I went across the water again uh, to London that I started to learn about cooperatives and collectives, um, really from books and reading, some policy research as I was working on youth rights issues and drug policy. Um, and that's where I started to learn about cooperatives. And then fast forward into um, my early 30s, I actually ended up joining an organization out of movement building work called Movement Net Lab. And it was then that I got introduced to the New York uh, City Network of Worker on Cooperatives and started to learn much more about their work and their connection. Um, also, um, I believe through CUNY, they had another program where they had a worker co-op uh, program under their labor uh, department and mm -hmm. uh yeah once once i got introduced there i feel like I, I got the formal i would say the formal education and then i went to amherst uh college under the center for popular economics for their uh boot camp for a summer uh and yeah <laughs> right right after that I, I feel like the rest is history like um I became very vested and interested um even my time i would say um when I got introduced and I was connected with the New York City of Worker on Cooperatives, um, I was also doing a lot of funding and philanthropy work. I had just gotten into that out of the organizing work that I was doing in Newark. And at that time, there was no language for it, but I was also engaging in participatory grant making. So I was just very involved around like governance, how we make decisions in ways that feel equitable so that everyone's needs, wants, desires can be met as much as possible that people can live with with that and create livelihood out of that. So that's when I started getting introduced to co-ops. And I feel like with everything else in the trajectory of like my my life journey in terms of like my learning experiences, both, both quote unquote formal mm -hmm. in the academy and then outside of the academy, there was always this question around the role of 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 black and brown people and people outside of the boundaries of I would guess I guess I would say um of the awareness of of how whiteness is centered in this country um in all different social um and societal norms that get centered and placed as part of status quo I became much more interested in a, in a part of what were the roles and the contributions of those people to many of the concepts, ideas, facets of practices and, and systems that, um, that we're all engaged with. And so, uh, I became much more interested really in the, in the area of co-ops around the contributions of, of black people in particular and the history of, of black people to cooperative development. And so, um, I would also say there's uh, Jessica Diemhardt's book, Collective Courage, that's been informative to my work also. Uh, and then, you know, other other sources of reading and information. So that's how I came in, into contact with co-ops. And that led me ultimately to create uh, Zeal as a co-op. Uh, and it was able to, in many ways, comprehensively merge my, you know, kind of strategic project management, you know, mind 
from like, you know, I think all of the engineering and the putting of things together and then all of my, you know, hidden talents and, and creative passions uh, that I had for the arts and the social justice work to be like, ah, I can actually like create this cooperative that supports black artists who are like putting beautiful work out into the world, but still hold these tenets of justice, equity, and liberation. So, uh, I have this book collective carriage right by my desk. It's my Bible. <laughs> it's the, it's collective carriage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhart, a history of African American cooperative economic thought and practice. And, uh, it, it is a tremendous book about the history because she said when she first started writing this, which would be about 20 years ago, that she was told that blacks didn't do co-ops. Blacks was a white hippie thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, she was amazed at the knowledge that she was able to get, the, the amount of knowledge that's out there and the amount of practice that blacks have done, just like you said, in your home, uh, when you look at how how from Ghana your parents brought over that we're going to sit down and we're going to talk this thing out and everybody has a voice. Uh, everybody gets to say uh, on, on what the solution will be. And then they taught you about service. So collective work service is just a part of the nature of most of African cultures. Ubuntu, I am because you are. You are because I am. And if we're working that way, then it's automatically how can how can we work together to get to accomplish things? Okay, how did you get into this art world? Because I'm seeing engineering, computer science, uh, urban planning. I, I don't see art in there anywhere. How did you get into the art world? How did I get into the art world? <laughs> Um, So uh, the thing about me, when I was at Syracuse, I had a lot of art friends, a lot of art friends that I hung around. (laughs) Okay. And I I would say one of the, I think one of the friends who really, um, I would say formally in the art world, uh, I think by by association supported me um, in, in getting in there. Uh, was Latoya Ruby Frazier. Um, you know, I think very early on in our um, acquaintance, we were able to learn about um, each other's lives and our families. And uh, shortly after college, when she was starting to work on her project, um, Notion of a Family, which uh, featured a series of photographs and uh, film video images in the short uh, bet- of the relationship between her, her mother, and her grandmother, mm. um, situated in Braddock, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh, and dealing with the issues of environmental racism and built environment and, and the steel mills and how all of that was impacting her family's health and well being. Uh, and given that, you know, I also was getting this urban planning degree, I was just so fascinated with this body of work that was culminating for her out outside of, you know, um, her time at Syracuse when we were, you know, just chilling, hanging out, mm-hmm. you know, having fun as college students. And um, when I was at Young People for uh, as a fellow, I was like, I would love to like write a curriculum like based on your your work for um young people in mm-hmm. York, New Jersey. And so like we started collaborating on her work and how to use her art as a way to educate young black people in York, New Jersey around the issues that they also face. Cause I think there's similarities between Pittsburgh and Newark as these deindustrialized cities. Uh, where there are many black people. And so uh, when we collaborated that on that project, that was like my first opening to be like, oh, like I'm a creative, but I still couldn't own that, you know? Uh, and so I would see her, uh, you know, with her openings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then I had several other friends who were in galleries and shows. And so I would just attend, I'd be the friend that would support my other black artist friends, but still had the, you know, 
philanthropy nonprofit job and was doing a lot of the social justice and movement building work, but was not claiming the the role of artist right. in my at the time. Like it just it wasn't there for me. I think at the time I still had a lot of my uh, and for good reason. My parents and you know voices and uncles and aunts voices of like engineer doctor lawyer. <laughs> 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 And we need money. And when we get old, who's going to take care of us? You know, so I had that. So I was like, let me keep my my philanthropic job. Let me keep my job. Hmm. And, you know, I'll do these things as extracurricular activities. So shout out to Latoya. But uh, I think by her being who she is, by me watching her, it, it opened up the door for me to be like, huh, I, I actually am seeing a lot of opportunities in how to use art and culture to... You move people. And I, I, I distinctly remember when I had Latoya and her mother speak to a group of young men in Newark, New Jersey, who were in juvenile detention. That experience was so transformative for me. Um, I had partnered with my friend who was part of a, a program, uh, Tanisha McCarris, who also Alan, moved out. Of- sorry to cut you off, but we're going to have to take our first break here. Got you. And we'll come back. Everybody out there, I'm talking to Alan Fringpong of Zeal, who's in Inglewood. Zeal has an office in Brooklyn, in Inglewood, in Miami, and Accra, Ghana. And he has gotten degrees in engineering and and, uh, urban planning, but he's in the arts world now. And so when we come back, we're going to talk about Zeal and the art world and the different projects that they're having as a cooperative. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. And Mr. Alan Fringpong is our guest today. He's with Zeal. He's in Inglewood, California this morning, and it's early out there. But we want to move now. We, we've talked about your background and how you got into the arts from engineering and urban planning. You told us what Zeal is. Could you give me what Zeal does one more time? Yeah, so Zeal is a worker-owned creative arts studio alliance. We provide creative talent development, cultural production support, with ex- exhibition and activations. Um, we're most known for our, our work in Miami for Who Owns Black Art that we launched in 2019. And then we do creative placemaking um, so that Black artists uh, can own the means of their cultural production in spaces and places. And our vision is to create spaces for Black artists to thrive. Okay. Okay. And Zeal is a worker-owned cooperative. How many members do you have? We currently have four of us as uh, worker owners, and we have uh, seven studio members as freelancers uh, currently between Inglewood and uh, New York. Okay. Okay. We've got 11 of us. Fantastic. And, and what kinds of art? Is it just paintings, or what kind of arts do you all do? Yeah, so it spans between visual and performing arts, and uh, it's from paintings, mixed media, um, multimedia for folks who are working in film, and and even for myself, um, I work in sound also um, as a conceptual artist. Um, And those artists, you know, their work doesn't just live within uh, the museum or the gallery. We think very expansively about the ways that art and culture can influence society. And so we've had artists whose work has been in television shows like Insecure or Random Max of Flyness on HBO, um, to working with fashion brands like Greg Lauren, around the Deconstructing Americana project, to even thinking about how art can be on wallpaper, <laughs> you know? Uh, okay. Like with one of the artists that came out of our studio incubator, Eileen Itzel Meta. So we think in a very expansive way around the um, creative industry, around how art and culture can uh, impact people. So what about dance and music? 
Oh uh, yeah, the, um, music as well. Um, actually, uh, Sine Nichols, uh, who is one of our founding members based in Brooklyn, New York, is a musician, dancer, actress. Um, so yeah, really across visual and perform performance arts, we uh, support uh, Black artists and their creativity, talents, gifts, skill sets. So. When I think about music particularly, I get that a lot of musicians would sign contracts and the folks on the other end of the contracts would get all of the money and they got very little and they had all of the rights and everything. So what are you all doing in Zeal that would help the musician, the artist, get the money? Yeah, so, you know, with our values of love, joy, grace, and abundance as like our key values and how we strive to walk in the world, we really think about how our ways of being can support us in practicing cultural equity for artists to own the means of their cultural production. And so we really focus and use the creative value chain as a framework to shift how we look at supply and demand in the art world and uh, by and large within creative industries. And we say, what does it mean for an artist to look at their process of creation and shift that so that we are mitigating the risks and the associated harms legally and financially when an artist creates a body of work? And so we 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 look at creative commons we look at licensing uh we as a cooperative have a cooperative trademark and and so we start to look at all of the different mechanisms that can begin to make sure that the artist really benefits from their production of work um on the visual art end uh we just actually the show that uh I just did the exhibition we did in Ghana we had 80 20 splits for sale of work, meaning the artist gets 80% and Zeal gets 20%. And because of, because of the fact that we're a cooperative, that 20% is supporting the administrative function, the operations, the accounting supports that are available to all of our members. And so it's really a win-win situation that we try to create across creation, production of work, in the studio or in studio spaces, depending on the artist's uh, medium of work. And, and then I think we also try to think creatively around distribution uh, of, of, of the work too. And I think that's probably one of our biggest hurdles because in the United States and finding black owned distribution spaces across the creative industry, um, there are very few, you know, that um, have the ability to reach people at scale. And so um, we're really in the thick of actually thinking of, of some solutions and partnerships around that. But I think looking at equitable ways of contracting, focusing on pay equity is really big for us. And so all of those mechanisms across our creative value chain is to ensure that we are protecting artists' rights. We're able to respect and respect each other for our talents, gifts, and skill sets that mitigate the exploitation and the extraction that we all have experienced. And then um, through our creativity, we try to find forms of solutions and redress around that. So those are some of the facets of how we work with artists and some of our partners, especially with the legal support and our partners that we have, such as Gerard um, Anthony Law Group. Uh, he also works with Afropunk, so he's been very supportive to us and thinking creatively about legal parameters and, and entertainment. Uh, the co-op work that we do, we also have got a lot of co-op legal support from Hofstra University uh, from their community law clinic. They were pivotal as well as It Takes Root and really the establishment of the co-op and our operating agreement and our management of the co-op. Okay. I know the um, law clinic at CUNY, but I don't know the one that you just mentioned. Okay. So that that's extremely important to get that help. Yes. So... What's your desired impacts? What are you trying to accomplish? I mean, you mentioned that a little bit, wanting to get wealth, to keep wealth in the hand. You, you call them uh, creatives, uh, the artists. You want to make sure that, that the wealth stays in their possession. 
but what else does Zill want to accomplish? Yeah, we want to create a pipeline of Black visual and performance artists that um, can exist within and outside of, you know, cultural institutions, and that we can use art in a way that provides a source of healing for people and fostering a lifestyle of community care uh, and a practice of that uh, with other creatives and um, creating, you know, economic sustainability through a practice of solidarity and applied learning so that artists have the supports and at least the um, capacity and knowledge base around business development um, around art, merchandising, and commerce um, outside of just the traditional means of what what it means to sell artwork or to sell music and um, and to think much more expansively about uh, the ways that artists can be supported and the ultimate impact that the art can have on the wellness of a community. So I would say those are like the, you know, several key um, areas where we are looking for a desired impact in our work and it's through our, through our membership base and our partners that we strive to do that. So are you familiar with uh, Ujama Collective out of Pittsburgh? Um, black women have started a co-op and they have a storefront. It's ujamacollective.org is their webpage. Um, but they formed together a co-op where the art, the jewelry and paintings and clothing, and but they sell paintings and work throughout the diaspora too. But they they cater toward black women. Mm. There's also a co-op in Zuni, New Mexico, the Zuni tribe. I think they've been there 50,000 years or 5,000 years. I don't remember, but the Zuni people have been in that area for quite a long time, and they have a, a co-op also. Uh, ARTZ is the name of their co-op. So I was just yeah. sitting here as you were talking of how to get these networks of co-ops or artists together to support each other. And are you familiar with downtown Crenshaw Rising? You're in Inglewood. Uh, they're in, in the heart of L.A., yeah, I am familiar. We are definitely familiar with them. Yeah, and shout out to Nikki and Damien. Um, we're very familiar with their work and, and watched their work progress over the years with the campaign that they um, launched for the community to acquire and then be able to steward the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall. And so the work that they've been doing in the Crenshaw area has been like pivotal as well, along with LA Co-op Lab, uh, Tree Yoga Co-op. Um, there are a couple of Black co-ops in LA that uh, we've been able to touch base with and connect with and, and build with. So that has been very dope for us to be able to engage in um, building with other co-ops in the LA area, in particular Black co-ops. So um, shout out to all of them. So Damien was telling me that they were looking at building a co-op of the artists, particularly black artists that are behind the camera because they have a hard time going from Crenshaw to Hollywood in terms of transportation and all of that. And so they were looking at building a studio for them right there in, at the time it was going to be at the mall, but it may be at a different location now. They were looking at doing, I don't know where they are on that, uh, but I found that to be quite exciting also. Yeah, no, I, I mean, just short thought on that, I think that it's important, again, looking at the entire value chain that we look at the talent behind the camera, uh, those creatives who are providing production support, um, and many times administrative support get overlooked, and they very very well play key and pivotal roles in, in arts and culture ecosystem. So that, that kind of infrastructure needs to be supported, you know, so I'm glad that they're exploring that. So you say that you can't get your vision without um, creating reconciliation, restoration, and reparations. So can you tell me what do you what do you mean by each of those, and how do you see getting reconciliation, restoration, and reparations? Yeah, uh, I think we believe if we're going to create a sustainable 
solidarity economy. And it's not just transactional or performative. We really do get to do the work of um, ensuring that our relationships really are grounded in um, an interdependent mindset uh, of abundance and that uh, we're able to center our wellness and that we mitigate and stop as much as possible all of the ways that we may exploit and extract each other in our business practices. So you just talked about contracts and all of that. And uh, I feel like we we get to re really ask this question. My you know my good friend Esther Arma always asks this question. It's like this question: What do we owe each other? You know, as Black people, and how we treat one another. And um, you know, I think there's a lot of learning we've gained over the past five years in what that means in terms of our relationships to each other in community. And it means you know. What are the ways that we're, you know, mitigating um, harm and conflict? And then when it does happen, what are the practices that um, can have us return to making sure that there's dignity and respect in our relationships? And sometimes that means even if people transition from the cooperative um, or transition in a particular area of their life where they may not want to engage, uh, in, in the kind of practices that they've been doing or that they evolve mm -hmm. as a, as creative, you know, and I think from there, um, the restoration means how do we transform the relationships of what was and the work that was, that was into what could be or what people want to be. And so I think we talk about shifting our politics around work and labor, you know, so that we are centering rest, uh, that we're not working, you know, crazy hours of the week um, that we're not engaged in exploitative work conditions. You know, I just think about the strike that uh, just ended with the, um, with many of the writers and the actors and actresses in the union. So like all of those things are the things that we um, try to engage in around shifting our, our conceptions around professionalism away and beyond um white supremacy in terms of um, its culture of exploitation and extraction. And I think the reparations piece is really around practicing solidarity through those two and thinking about creating a culture of, of, of repair and uh, regeneration in our finances to make sure that, yeah, we're sustainable into the future. We don't want to, uh, you know, end up having uh, institution that we build that two years after falls apart. Um, I think we're here for the long ride. And, and so it's taking the time to shift how we are investing financial capital grants, resources into our organization that provide mutual benefits for artists. And some of the conversations we're starting to engage in now is around community land trust, uh, being able to share and own assets that support uh, the cooperative in sustaining itself so that it provides a home for other artists in the future beyond us, you know? Right. So we're engaged in this like experiment that's five years old in many ways, but lives on the shoulders and the legacy of people who have come before us, like Spiral, like uh, the Black uh, Emergency Cultural Coalition, all of these different uh, movements and, and, and organizations and, and collectives, Black art collectives that have also done this work that we get to learn from and, and further. In reparations, how do you see the artists or zeal working toward getting reparations, particularly if you look for getting repayment from the U.S. government or California or New York or Miami? How do you see going about doing that? Well, we're in that right now. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm working on a multimedia anthology called The Remedy is Solidarity. Um, and it's a project of zeal where as part of a cultural strategy we've been developing uh, through the work that we've done through uh, Who Owns Black Art, which Tia Oso, one of our members, uh, is the executive producer of um we have been thinking about what it would look like to go through each of the municipalities in California, for instance, where we have our 
our studio practice based in Inglewood to um, meet with Black creatives and involve them in the process of not only art making, but using the art making to build public will and create a community archival of what is happening in this contemporary time with states and cities like California and New York who just passed their bill to engage towards um, enacting full comprehensive reparations for Black people here in the United States. And actually the exhibition that I just did in Ghana uh, was a part of that anthology too, shortly after the Accra Reparations Conference happened through the African Union. So through, through this anthology project, through a collection of exhibitions, zines, audiovisual testimonials, uh, we hope uh, for example, here in the state of California, that through these activations, we can be able to further fine tune and provide uh, proposals and directions that can inform the kind of bills that can go to the state legislature for a reparations program. And I think what that looks like in arts and culture is uh, universal basic income for creatives, being able to have a community reinvestment uh, fund that supports uh, the development of community land trust where there could be housing cooperatives for black folks in their community and in particular for for artists to be able to have live workspace to create their work uh, where there is uh, affordable housing mm -hmm. uh, where, where artists can live and we've seen many of the issues that artists have faced across our studio locations and affiliates uh, it's the reason why we named our vision Creating Spaces for Black Artists to Thrive, because many of the spaces uh, have not been a space historically for Black artists to create, produce, and even distribute their work, to share their work. And so, yeah, we hope with this, you know, anthology that we're engaging in from this year into 2026, that it can influence policy. And I don't think people typically put that together to say, you know, arts and culture can shift policy, but also uh, shift our material real conditions. And so uh, we're also working on a project here in Englewood, exploring the feasibility of creating a repair the community wealth building project um, where black businesses in the neighborhood are able to sustain themselves amidst the gentrification that's happening in Englewood. So there's the demonstration of the work, there's the creative production of the work that we hope we can shift the ways that we conduct business as creatives, as a model that can then inform also our material lift conditions. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's an endeavor that we're embarking on for the next two years, but it's based upon the work that we've been doing for the past four years, uh, based on the body of work we did in Miami. Uh, for Who Owns Black Art, where we experimented with some of those traditional models within the art world of how work is sold, how work is distributed, and figured out what are some other equitable ways to ensure that artists own much more of the means of their production so they can actually create a livelihood out of it and sustain themselves. I think the key word here is the sustainability. and that, That's not easy work. You no, know? Oh, no, it's not easy work. But, I, you know... That's Martin Luther King, he would have Mahalia Jackson sing before he spoke. Every time I went to a meeting back in the 60s and the 70s, we all stood around in a circle and embraced, and we sang, We Shall Overcome. And Jimi Hendrix said that if there's something to be changed in the world, then it can only be changed with music. Now, I'm not sure I totally believe in only with music, but I, I can say we can do a lot to change the world and what I hear you say in the policies through art and music being one of those art forms. So it would be interesting to see how zeal can create public will and public policy for artists using art to help to create those changes. Yeah, I think inevitably what we're saying implicitly is that culture is the bedrock of our politics and economics. So if we don't shift and change the way that we are in our being with each other, and that's the behavioral, that's the emotional parts of us, if we don't shift that, then we will reinforce the same ways of being that show up in our policies and our practices. 
it will inevitably occur. And so for us, the, the art that we're creating is a part of a world building that says another world is possible. And that world is grounded in solidarity, solidarity, a practice of solidarity that can be sustained, that can be the new normal, that can be the next way, or not even the next way, it can be um, a return, right? It can be a return to the ways that we have been that get to evolve in this contemporary time. So yeah, we'll see. But I think all of us are really excited about that work because it gives us the opportunity in California and New York where they just passed their bill. Um, my hope is that we'll be able to engage in that work in the South, given the work that we started in Miami as well, to yeah, engage with Black creatives in their communities at large in that kind of way, to explore these issues beyond, I think, some of the polarization that we've found around reparations, because most of the dominating narrative has been around cash payment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, yes, cash payment. And I always say, like, what are the ways that we're going to find ourselves as a collective to sustain ourselves in an economy that has continually historically extracted and exploited us, even in our tax codes, you know, and so we can get all the money you know, you can get all the power, but keep your eyes on the final power and shout out to Lauren Hill, you know? <laughs> but like the, 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 the piece around the sustainability and the infrastructure for that is going to be equally as important as the cash payment, you know? Because otherwise we're not going to be able to sustain our finances and, and have generational wealth, you know? And I think that's one of the pieces around community wealth building is making sure that we have an infrastructure in place that can work across the supply chain from our credit unions to our worker co-ops to our creative um, our community land trusts like how is all of that working within an economic system that is going to sustain us into the future you know i, I just say amen bro amen yeah we, like we, that's the thing yeah you know, we only have a minute left so what message would you like to leave people with uh the message really is on, yeah, we get to promote a life of solidarity and how we treat each other. And I feel like for Black History Month, um, I'm walking with this um, piece in my mind around, you know, uh, how do we practice solidarity in our hearts, minds, and souls, you know? And what can we learn from our history as a people that can inform us in walking better in that path every day? And so I think that's like the major, you know, thing I'll leave with and that folks can find us on uh, zeal.coop, C-O-O-P, zeal.coop is our website, real easy to, to find us. And that's us also on Instagram. And, um, you know, stay tuned and look out for us for the work that we will continue to do here in the um, Southern California area, back in New York. Z E A L dot C O O P. Thank you, brother Alan. Thank you so very much for taking out the time. Everybody out there, we'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperatively, solidarity, helping each other. See you next Thursday.